Good morning, Malta and Goza, and welcome to another edition of Love and Daily, brought to you by Browns and You. Uh, I'm Chris Bregin, your host, joined today by Sam Vassallo. How are you, Sam? I'm fantastic. How are you? <laughs> I'm good, thank you. Uh, a week is already flying by. Uh, just before we start with the headlines, I want to remind you that this week we've got a Father's Day competition going with Browns and You. All you need to do is tag your dads in the comments below. Do it now before everything starts. Uh, and uh, you could win 80 euro, 80 euro, 80 euro worth of hair, laser hair removal from Browns and You. So uh, for all those dads that want to have some more uh, definition and take some extra hair off their of their backs or their chest. Uh, this could be the gift for them. Um, so let's start with the headlines of of today. So we'll start by talking about the public inquiry into the Daphne Corona Galizia murder um, and and how that's linked to electro gas. Now you know um, we had. Uh, the state witness saying that Jorgen Fenech, the prime suspect, told him this is the last thing um, needed to close the electrogas chapter. The murder is the last thing needed to close the electrogas chapter. Um, we also, uh, the, the, the inquiry has also led to accusations on the side of the Nationalist Party. Uh, Carl Sanino Navarra, the Labour TV presenter, has gone a step further than the state witness and claimed that Jorgen Fenech offered the PN leader 250,000 euros personally to prevent MEP David Kaza's re-election. Um, also, at least 155 Indians have been left in limbo as Malta keeps postponing their, rep their, their repatriation flights. Um, a developing story over there, we'll be following it today as well. Uh, MEP, Labour MEP Alfred Sant has doubled down on his comments in favour of the discussion on abortion, saying abortion is a, hum is a civil right in Europe and Malta needs to have a serious debate. Uh, and Carfree Malta, 42 localities are working to temporarily pedestrianise their streets. So thanks for watching us from all over the world. Uh, and we'll start with the first story. Sam, tell us what happened in the public inquiry yesterday. So yesterday was quite a dramatic turn in the public inquiry. In fact, state witness Melvin Thomas said in court yesterday that a main suspect, Jürgen Fenech, talked about the Daphne Corona Galizia murder and the electrogas deal in the same breath. This has been the first time it has officially been linked uh, in court. Just to refresh our memories, this electrogas consortium was selected to build uh, the power station at Delimara. It's always been linked to corruption claims. In fact, Daphne Caruana Galizia herself had reported that the Maltese government guaranteed a 360 million um, euro loan for electrogas. Um, it's also been linked to the issue of um, fuel hedging. So in fact, Malta pays some of the highest rates um, for utilities uh, in Europe. And of course, Jürgen Fenech um, was one of the main directors and shareholders for um, Electrogas. Of course, as we know, Jürgen Fenech was linked to um, the Panama Papers scandal. His company, 17 Black in Dubai, was linked to um, Kitsch Gembrian Conrad Mitzi's uh, companies in Panama. So um, quite, quite, um, quite a revelation in court. What do you make of it? Yeah, it was interesting because Melvin Toma used the words uh, it's a Dignon Osni and it was interpreted in different ways by different media houses. So uh, we've taken that to mean it is the last thing needed to close this chapter, sort of the, 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 the final bit of the of the plan. Uh, some people have, have interpreted that as being this is the last thing I need, you know, the the the, the, the worst thing to, 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 to ruin the plan. Um, either way, I, I think you know there is that connection with with electro gas, and and that's seen as a, a motive, so to speak, for for the murder. We know that that Daphne had a number of leaked uh, documents uh, from uh, the electro gas deal, and uh, was was a harsh critic. Uh, of it. Um, also, uh, Nationalist MEP Roberta Metzola has uh, called on the EU Commission to investigate the deal in light of the revelations in court. Uh, so, so yeah, it's interesting. We, we also had a, a number of other points come out in court. You know, Melvin Tome also spoke about how uh, his life had ended the day uh, he killed Daphne Caron Galizia. And you know, had uh, Jason Atsoprado, one of the lawyers, um, say, you know, it was actually uh, her life that ended, you know, but he said his ended too. Um, and 
and maybe to move on to the second story, which is also kind of related, um, Melvin Doma has spoken about how uh, the so Melvin Doma is the state witness. Let's just keep that in mind. And he's said that Morgan Fennec was the prime suspect in this case. Um, had told him that he he had offered fifty thousand euros to the Nationalist Party to prevent the re-election of MEP David Kaza. Now MEP David Kaza is quite uh, again a, a harsh critic of the electric gas deal. Uh, he he's uh, you know he he followed Daphne's line in in a, in a strong way and in, in, uh, and followed that up in, in the European Parliament. You know, uh, so so he was seen as a as a thorn in in Jurgen Fenech's side. Um, interesting to keep in mind that, that David Gaza did get elected at the MEP elections, uh, so if there was any effort to, to, to knock him off, that didn't work. However, he did lose a significant number of votes uh, when you compare to the number of votes that Roberta Metzola actually gained, for example. Um, so so that's, that's interesting, and, and there's been a development on that as well. So Labour TV presenter Kvastan and Navarra uh, yes, they claim that uh, that Jürgen Fenech actually offered Adrian Delia 250,000 euros to prevent uh, Kaza's re-election. And he did this at uh, Jürgen Fenech's house during a lunch um, after Daphne was was killed. Now, Delia has always denied meeting Jürgen Fenech after the revelations of his ownership of 17 Black. That was in 2018. So he doesn't deny meeting Morgan Fennec before 2018, uh, although he kind of gave the impression that he only met him at, at sporadic sort of social gatherings. I think if he actually did meet him for lunch in this way at his house, uh, this is starting to look uh, a, a lot uglier. Uh, what's interesting as well is that David Take, a nationalist MP, uh, had, had made these claims himself a while back that, that the Nationalist Party was offered this amount of money, uh, an amount of money, 50,000, I believe, uh, and he's now calling for an investigation both within his party and by the police to see whether this bribe uh, took place in, in, in any way. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think now, you know, th there's going to be scrutiny on the side of the Nationalist Party as well and on Adrian Delia in terms of his relationship with Jürgen Fennec, which he's always said uh, was, was not, no relationship at all, really. Um, Sam, what do you make of the story? The web just keeps on growing and it's just, it's, it's no, it's just another layer on another layer, both parties implicated, I just, I can't wait till the day that it's it's over and we can just have um, someone make a movie out of it and just see how intense and complicated this this whole story is, really. Yeah, that's it, and 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 to try and uh, get some closure from this, right? Because uh, it seems to have uh, it's it's so intricate, involves so many institutions, so many people who've had countless resignations now about it. In fact, uh, a point that we should mention is that Chris Cardona, the deputy uh, Labour leader, yes, they did uh, submit his resignation, according to, to the Prime Minister. Uh, he, had, he had waited a, a while. The Prime Minister had um, made it quite clear that uh, you know he expects Chris Cardona to, to resign, and there was some uh, hesitation at first, but it seems now that that is that is happening. Um, so let's move, let's change the subject a bit. Uh, there was a, an interesting human story, Sam, yesterday that you worked on. Uh, at least 155 Indians are left in limbo. Uh, why? What, what's happening? Yes, indeed. So um, you know, despite despite rhetoric that we're we're past COVID nineteen and and we're in this new era, there are some people who are still suffering these implications particularly, as usual, the most vulnerable in society. In fact, um, there are at least 155 Indian citizens who are stuck in Malta, left in limbo after their repatriation flight back to India keeps getting cancelled and postponed indefinitely. So in a joint letter seen by Loving Malta, which was signed by at least 33 uh, Indian workers who are here, um, they, they have essentially pleaded that, that um, authorities help them get back to India. These, these um, Indian citizens have expired work permits. Um, you know, they, they obviously were informed that, that their flight was cancelled the day before. So you can imagine they had already vacated, um, you know, the housing, you know, they were, they were all packed and, and ready to go. And, um, you know, and this comes out. Obviously, I've, I've spoken to some of them myself, you know, there are some pregnant women and um, vulnerable people, 
um, you know, they've, they've had to borrow money from their families at home or who are, aren't doing that well either because of the, the virus situation. Um, and when we reached out to, to authorities, it seems that they are playing the blame game, essentially. So Maltese authorities are saying this has nothing to do with them, that, um, you know, they had reached out to Indian authorities to, to request permission for landing and they were denied. Whereas Indian authorities are saying they had never even, you know, reached out to request permission. So hopefully, you know, even despite people thinking that, that the, the situation is re returning to normal, there are a lot of people you know, beyond them as well. I know that there are students as well, third country nationals who are on expired vi uh, visas, whose um, home countries' borders are still closed and are stuck in limo as well and, and waiting to see what their next move is going to be. Yeah, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a really serious situation eh? and, and uh, these sort of people end up uh, in, in the cracks of, uh, in gaps of sort of justice, so to speak. No, no one's really uh ensuring that 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 they're that they're okay um and and you mentioned you know the rhetoric about us COVID being behind us i think it's worth noting as well that yesterday there were another six cases so i think we had three days in a row six new cases every day uh, two recoveries the number of active cases has gone up to 43 um and i don't know about you sam but i'm kind of now uh, missing those charming Gauchi press conferences to get some sense of you know our R number and, and uh, how worrying this is because if you if you go out you know today in Malta it seems like there was never really a pandemic I mean you see some people wearing masks some people wearing face shields and um, but other than that life is almost completely back to normal um so you know i, I just i just wonder what what it's looking like especially uh, in light of you know some some other places like beijing closing up again after having reopened so there there's a bit of a concern over there that maybe uh, the waves are not just in the sea uh, we'll see let's move on to the uh, next story a uh, completely different uh, discussion so as we know, uh, Labour MEP and former Prime Minister Alfred Sant uh, recently uh, spoke to The Guardian about how uh, abortion legislation in Malta is inevitable, uh, given the, the, the situation internationally. Uh, abortion has become a, a topic uh, recently, especially because of the fact that flights have been have been stopped in Malta for a number of months and usually uh, women who, who, who need abortions in Malta tend to uh, go to the UK or other places where it is not 100% uh, banned as it is in Malta. Uh, so Albert Zahn had a press conference yesterday where he was speaking about the EU's budget and, and, and some other issues but he was asked by uh, journalists about um, his comments on abortion and he doubled down on those comments he said you know abortion is a civil right in the EU uh, and Malta needs a serious debate what's really interesting I thought is that he, he gave this press conference uh, alongside another Labour MEP um, Josian Kutayar uh, who was also asked uh, about about these uh, about abortion and she said you know to her she agrees abortion is not a black and white issue uh, and there should be a serious debate on it. So now you've got two Labour MEPs out of four uh, who are who are speaking openly about this topic. Keep in mind, abortion is a massive taboo in Malta. Politicians very rarely speak about it, except to say that you know it should never be legalised. So 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 now there seems to be a, a, a discussion starting to happen, at least within the the Labour Party. Sam, you were at that press conference. What was it like? What was the the uh, what what was the tone of what they were saying? So it, it was quite an interesting press conference. It seemed that um, the other journalists, like me, wanted to ask their opinions about uh, more local issues um, rather than, you know, what's happening at, at EU level. Um, they were they were questioned about what they thought about, you know, the Daphne Caruana Galizia case, and then I, you know, posed my question about abortion, which I thought initially was going to be completely shut down. Um, but in fact, yes, um, Alfred Sant said that abortion is a civil right. He actually wrote about this on on facebook you know he mentioned um previous polarized issues in malta the divorce debate the bikini debate in the 80s you know um and now that this is kind of the next the next issue that needs to you know we need to sit down at the political table have this this debate realize that this is not a religious issue and is you know solely an issue of health and an issue between women who need abortions and their doctors. Um, 
I had initially addressed this question to Dr. Sant, and I said, you know, if Ms. Kataya, if you would like to respond as well, I'd be very interested to hear what you have to say. Um, keeping in mind, Dr. Sant was the only one who voted in favor of an amendment um, in an EU resolution to protect uh, reproductive rights of women in the EU um, amid the pandemic. But Josiane Kutayar did step in and said, I would like to comment. And she, she agreed with Dr. Sant and said, this is not a black and white issue. We need, you know, sexual health education. We need increased resources for the GU clinic. So the dialogue is, 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 is developing rapidly. I mean, just, just uh, this week, Jean-Claude Mikalef, MP Labour backbencher, you know, came out and, and uh, as very pro-life and, and, and used a, a um, an image of a, of a stillborn, which has nothing to do with abortion. And I mean, the comments that I saw were, were majority, you know, basically shooting him down. So I, this is something that I've never seen happen when it comes to, you know, this abortion debate, people actually coming forward, you know, publicly and saying, you know, we need to have this conversation, whether you would have an abortion yourself or not. And I really look forward to see to see this, this um, debate take on to parliament, take on to, you know, civil society. And yes, very excited. Cool. Uh, and the last story, uh, Kofri, I know that this was, Kofri Malta, uh, I know that this was something that uh, originally emerged in a COVID calls episode uh, uh, that, that, that I, when I interviewed the transport minister Ian Borge, uh, he said that uh, post COVID he wants to see uh, the, the continuation of fewer cars on the road and that there would be um, some localities would pedestrianize their squares. Uh, what what exactly is being proposed, Sam? So uh, this is you know a positive uh, revelation from from um, the COVID era, I suppose. You know there were less cars on the street because people weren't going to the office. And um, yes, Ian Borge said that he wants to extend this kind of car-free Malta. So essentially, what he's proposing is um, pedestrianizing certain localities and certain streets, either. On, on, on an alternative basis or like fully pedestrianized. So essentially there are 42 localities, thankfully uh, Slima, which I think is the one that needs the most is included. And um, they essentially look to pedestrianize certain streets, um, either pedestrianizing in the day and then letting cars pass at night or the other way around, or completely closing off uh, streets to cars or, you know, closing off partial parts of streets for, for pedestrians, which I think needed to happen 22 years ago when I was born, but you know, better better now than, than never, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so so we'll, we've got to wait and see, I guess, uh, how, how that works and, and what it actually looks like in the end. So, but that brings us to the end of our program, Love and Daily, uh, we're with you every morning at 10 a.m to give you an update of what's going on in Malta. Uh, and this week we are sponsored by Browns and You uh, for, a, for a Father's Day competition where we're giving away 80 euros worth of laser hair removal. All you need to do is tag your dads in the comments below uh, and we'll pick a winner today and every day this week. Uh, so the, your last chance will be tomorrow. Uh, so be sure to do this and you'll give your dad uh, a, a, an interesting present uh, for, for Father's Day this week. This Sunday. Um, that's it for us. From us, uh, I've been Chris Perejin, joined by Sam Vassallo, and we'll be with you again tomorrow. And until then, have a day full of loving.